Um, my name is Brian Turk um, of Aluma Consulting, uh, Principal Founder, HR Tech Services. Um, and our next session here is from uh, Mr. Shrikant, uh, uh, Shrikant uh, Pedophile of Harbinger Systems, President of Harbinger Systems, uh, Realigning Product Roadmaps, Strategies for Talent Management for the Modern World. Um, Shrikant, welcome, thank you, and uh, take it away. You're on mute though, so we'll we'll have you unmute yourself. <laughs> oh, if we can. Oh, wait. Can you hear me? Yeah. So so yeah, I mean, uh, I got this new background. So with as if I didn't have enough glow. <laughs> well, so. You look angelic. Nice <laughs> aura. <laughs> I I thought somebody does. Spoof on me at uh, from HRTA. So, but anyway, thank you. thank you for the background and uh, appreciate that. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, hosting this uh, discussion. And uh, um, there's a great set of panelists. Uh, I'll momentarily introduce uh, what I hope everybody is in because I was having some difficulty getting into the session myself. But I'm assuming that everybody is is, is there. Everyone right now is has been admitted. They kind of pop up and then we, we let them in as they show up. So sorry if there's been a lag for anyone uh, so far. We'll stay on top of that. Uh, Shrikant no Frank, sorry to interrupt you. However, Richard is still facing an issue joining in. So I've sent him the Zoom invite. I'm hoping he should be in in a while. Okay. Yeah, it looks like everybody's here on the panelist side, I believe. Yeah, this is Richard. Thanks. Perfect. Um, I hope you're seeing the screen in full screen. Yes. More? Yeah. Cool. Great. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ward and the TA team. Uh, and good morning, uh, everybody, or good evening, uh, based on where you're located. Uh, today, as we're talking about uh, realigning product roadmaps, and we're going to cover a lot of topics and have our panelists also share a lot of views. So when it comes to uh, product management, uh, it in many ways works as a proxy for the business. And it, uh, for most product organizations, it is an epicenter uh, within the organization. Uh, it has overlaps, uh, if you will, with strategy, product market fit, customer experience, pricing, uh, operations, etc. Uh, however, today, um, based on our topic, we will we'll try to stick to roadmaps and how to realign them in, in you know changing times and so forth and we will try to use examples from data uh, user experience integrations kind of illustrations of what roadmap decisions uh, one must make uh, so moving further uh, if you if you ask a product manager uh, about their concerns today you are going to get a wide variety of answers like roadmaps, value proposition, pricing. Um, maybe there's something around m and that's happening, post-crisis capacity building, remote team management. But uh, all of that is very difficult to cover in a very uh, in a short time. So, so we will focus primarily on roadmap and uh, how to realign them, how to reprioritize them and try to focus there so that we get the most uh, out of this uh, particular discussion. And at this moment, uh, I would like to do a quick introduction to a panel uh, who have been uh, very generous with their time and said that you know they'll come in and participate. So we have uh, Chris Sella, the VP Product Management uh, at Great People. We have David Solo, Chief Science Officer and SVP of Products, Sciolytics. We have Raghav Singh, Director of Product Management from Salesforce. And uh, we also have Richard Mann, Chief Product Officer at Decisely. Uh, I believe Richard is, has joined the session now. So maybe with Chris, uh, you can tell us a little bit about yourself, company, and you know what specifically makes you interested in this topic. Absolutely. Thank you, Shikant. And thanks for having me. Um, I'm Chris Joe. I'm the VP of Product for Great People. Um, so... Uh, what everybody knows product management to be, I sort of run it here uh, at Great People. We're a global enterprise talent acquisition platform. So we serve a, a very wide variety of customers across the globe. Um, 
for the entire talent acquisition lifecycle. Um, so big sort of core enterprise technology. Um, I've been in the uh, in the, the game with talent acquisition for about 17 years um, and have spent most of my time focused on the recruitment marketing, kind of employment assessments, um, candidate relationship management, applicant tracking um, kind of technologies. Um, so, you know, in, in running product management for sort of large enterprise systems like this, um, working with uh, global brands to solve extremely complex and sort of always moving target uh, types of processes. Um, so I've always found this type of work extremely interesting because of exactly what Srikant just mentioned. Um, it becomes the place where all roads sort of lead to in terms of um, how the uh, organization is going to evolve. Um, you know, as business strategies evolve, as technologies evolve, as the markets evolve, product management is kind of uniquely positioned uh, to be the function that um, best sort of digests all of those pieces together and comes up with a, a centralized sort of strategy to address it. Um, and that's why I like doing this kind of thing. <laughs> uh, thanks, Chris, and look forward to your participation in this uh, session. Uh, David, um, yeah. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, David Solot. Uh, I'm an IO psychologist. I'm the Chief Science Officer and SVP of Product for Sciolytics. Uh, and at Sciolytics, we have two major products in our uh, product line. We have the Digital Chalk uh, LMS, uh, and we have the Uptick Sales Simulation System. Um, and I've spent most of my career, I've been in the industry uh, assessment and learning for about 18 years now. And uh, what really interested me in all of this is uh, I've always wanted to focus on making data actionable. Um, I think that there are a tremendous number of good ideas uh, across our industries, um, but it's about being able to turn that data into insights uh, that the layperson can use, that you don't need to be an expert in order to get meaning uh, and to learn from past experience. So for me, I've always had this interest in how do we take this data and um, enable a wide range of people to use it? Um, and one of the ways of doing that is through good product management and making sure that the products you design are aligned with the needs of your marketplace uh, and are easily usable and provide a good user experience. So that's that's really what drew me to this uh, to this topic. Yeah, thanks, thanks, David. Look forward to you know hearing more of your views as well, uh, Raghav. Oh, yes, thank you. And uh, I'm uh, Raghav Singh. I'm at uh, Salesforce. I head up a line of products for that are focused on the HR space. Um, my career be in uh, HR tech, and it's pretty much all been on the product side. I've been in HR tech. It was about 20 years. Started out with Taleo and then worked at a number of some of the other vendors in the space. Most recently joined Salesforce about a year ago. And uh, one of the things about the product role for me is that uh, certainly there are a lot of opportunities even today in new and different things that we can do with HR for HR. What drew me to Salesforce is that Salesforce has, you know, if it sounds like a plug for Salesforce, <laughs> not intended to be that, yeah. but is that we have a very flexible platform that allows us to build very quickly and rapidly. And I think what drew me to this topic was that in that sense, we certainly had some advantages that we could build for in a rapidly changing world very quickly and adapt to that. If you've heard of the work.com line of products that have been released, uh, that was a prime example of how to do that. And that is really what uh, you know has been front and center for me that how quickly we've had to adapt and what we've had to do for this space. Mm. So I'm going to stop there for now. Great. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing your experience and as well as, you know, what you're doing at Salesforce in some of the future slides as well. So look, look forward to that. Richard, um, finally you're here. Yeah. Uh, wait. Richard, I think you're on mute. My name is Richard Mann and I'm the Chief Product Officer at Decisely. And Decisely is a five-year-old startup. So we're... Uh, you know, a little bit smaller. Um, we, uh, we, we build a recruit to retire platform for HR, uh, include the benefits administration and all the things that are involved in employee, employee, you know, work experience. 
Um, I've been in this industry for the majority of my career. I've been a founder at three different startups. One of them was a company named Silink in the early 90, uh, late 90s. Another one was Plan Source and uh, mm. especially. Great. Thanks, Richard. And uh, yeah, you, you two have immense experience in products and I'm sure your views uh, will be able to you know, learn from them as well. So, so moving further um, to, to our topic. Uh, so before we get on to and, and move deeper in our subject, uh, we will spend a couple of minutes talking about the market, uh, take a you know, deep dive into business strategies companies are using today and what those strategies mean for product management uh, specifically. Um, when it comes to Harbinger, we, we have a vantage point, uh, if you will, because we work with a lot of product companies, specifically in the HR tech space, and we help them build the products or parts of the product. So therefore, we get uh, some insights in terms of how the leadership is thinking and what, what they are moving. And we'll share some of that. But I think equally important would be to hear from the panelists, from their specific roles of how they are looking at uh, realigning their product map roadmaps or readjusting them based on market. So, uh, so we'll maybe I'll take you quickly through what the market is thinking. So, when we talk about market shifts, I think there are three important things that uh, that really comes out. One is that we see that customer priorities are changing. What that means is customers are thinking about more about conserving cash. Uh, move with agility, more agility, think about more integrated solutions, uh, value more vendor flexibility. Uh, when you look at changing user behaviors, uh, the whole thing about now uh, the pandemic is, is going to continue and it's changed things. Therefore, remote work is going to become a default behavior in every organization. And no matter what the size is, they will... Uh, or how they were executing before remote work becomes critical. And overall, uh, based on the buying behaviors of users are also changing. Uh, and finally, the talent, uh, the, we, are, we are seeing that though there may be less recruitment happening or initially there was kind of layoffs and so forth, but with the speed at which People are building technology now and using technology to change things. Uh, there is a huge pressure on the talent side, finding the right talent and, you know, uh, keeping your roadmaps and things, uh, uh, being able to deliver on, on time. So some of the trends post-COVID, um, that's, that's primarily going to be uh, consistently you're going to see and all of us are seeing even today the number one thing is about uh, supporting remote uh, work environments and i think uh, most of us who who are into product uh, management or product engineering or defining this is one of the key aspects which is driving a lot of changes in terms of how we are thinking about the whole software uh, development and consumption processes some of the other things that 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 may be uh, equally important in different aspects, depending on what product you're building, uh, could be the change in buyer dynamics. Like uh, there's this not one stakeholder, there are multiple stakeholders, even in smaller organizations that that need to buy. So you need to design the product or think of the product from making sure that satisfies everyone's requirements. Uh, in terms of cloud, I think that's becoming like a de facto. Any on-prem solution is no longer exciting uh, for anybody. So, so I think that's probably uh, a key requirement or key change that every product uh, organization is going through. And finally, uh, when it comes to sales, you don't, you are not able to sell software by making visits, uh, showing demos in persons, and so forth. So the product itself has to speak uh, to to the to the buyer, and that puts even more onus on how you design and develop the software. So those are some of the things from our experience we are seeing what the industry is saying, and I think uh, it, this is. Uh, 
important for us to think that so what business strategies are our product companies using when it comes to uh, tackling some of these uh, requirements so from the pandemic point of view i think all of us went through this we all were initially thinking about conserving cash and that's what i think most companies did except for a few which were in a space where it's, it was it was growing no matter what uh, but when it comes to a more difficult question is like it, it's about how do you protect your customer base right i mean and do you and then there is an important decision for most product companies to make is do you do only protect your existing customers or you are finding new trends and new things where you can pivot to new uh, newer technologies so when you think about it from that perspective now one important thing you product management needs to focus is are these changes that sh- are short term or long term are we going to design products to cater to these changing requirements or are these changes very transient so that's an important question for all of us to debate and and uh, understand and at that point of time is is uh, it, it's a choice like if if you're going to make a lot of investment in in building new products how are you going to do that and whether those changes that your market changes that you're seeing is going to be transient enough so at that on this note i would like to bring in our panelists and uh, put this question to them um, maybe starting with richard this time saying that uh, you know what are you hearing and uh, in terms of changes that you're seeing in in the product or the area that you're focusing on and uh, have you changed the products in any way you built new features or looked at anything differently um yeah absolutely i think when you think about this you have to take into account you know decisely its customer base when the when the pandemic hit and there was a lockdown everybody including decisive is worried about conserving cash because it was a new and scary thing and nobody nobody knew what to expect but uh you know it uh there was a short term dramatic disruption in business but then it uh it recovered really really quick one of the things that we learned was our our business has grown dramatically during the pandemic you know in hindsight um the pandemic has been a good business thing for decisively and uh and i think that's primarily because of the nature of the customers that we have our customers tend to be national brands lots of small well, franchises they're national franchise national brands and you know if you look at uh and i'll give an example chick-fil-a so chick-fil-a has dine in and drive through well the 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 lockdown eliminated dine in and uh but i was talking to a chick-fil-a um operator in the last little while he said during uh, 2020 we had 20% year over year growth and it's all through the drive through and so um it was just a really interesting perspective you know they limited the drive through probably eliminated some service issues because people aren't coming into their store anymore they just have to make chicken sandwiches and deliver them through the drive through and their biggest problem was hiring enough people to do that and um and so um we've we've had a lot of growth it's been unprecedented um and uh, we're forecasting it to to continue but it does focus on your customers your customers needs and uh, the overall comment i will say is the pandemic was very good for big business the pandemic was really harsh on small business that that makes a lot of sense uh, richard so yeah great point great story about chikala so thanks for sharing raga uh, any anything from yes certainly you see the sales force has continued to grow through the pandemic and um, what we've seen is that very early on it was obvious that our clients and i mean our clients are companies of all sizes anyone can use the salesforce platform product were in a bind as to what to do in this situation which was why the work.com product line was created because you know most people most companies did not have 
any significant or in a lot of cases, any remote employees. So even something as simple as ensuring that people have the right equipment. I mean, they're talking about just a decent laptop and maybe a big monitor or something. Managing those kind of things was not something that was obvious to people as to how to ensure this. And so we pivoted very quickly to creating the product, which was to help manage a remote workforce. And as the pandemic has progressed, I think the point was made earlier that, well, this isn't going away. And that is true. It may be changing, but it isn't going away. Um, our uh, chief people officer uh, had an interview in the Wall Street Journal a few months back where he said that most of our employees are going to be working remote at least some of the time. And we recognize that that's also true for a lot of our customers. That is what we are hearing. So we are pivoting the product to become more on how to manage a hybrid workforce. People who may come in occasionally, people who will be working remotely in full. And, and there's a lot of aspects to this that will take a while to figure out. You know, again, I mean, one of the most obvious ones is that, well, if you've got people coming into meetings, but you've got some people who are outside, the people on the outside are clearly at a disadvantage. You know, I mean, you don't have the same view into the room. You do not have, I mean, these are not easy problems to solve by any means. So how do you deal with it? And those are the things where the product roadmaps that we are building are a work going to be a continuous work in progress. We will get some things right. We will get a lot of things wrong, I'm sure. But that will not turn out the way we we think they would at the beginning. So it is going to be a continuous process to deal with this because by most estimates from what I see, it's still early days. You know, we like to think that this is over. It's not over. It's just changed in different ways. Right. It's, it's going to be with us for a long time. Makes sense. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. A great example there as well in terms of how you have used or built something for the remote workforce. Uh, David, um, your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's been interesting. Um, I, I, I can relate to what Richard was saying when we got started, because one of the things that we've been specializing in is we specialized in experiential learning. Um, and as the needs of uh, employees to continue learning and continuing on development paths has gone on uh, throughout the pandemic, there's been a desire uh, for folks to be able to engage with their learning content in different ways. Um, so one of the things that we had specialized in is we had um, Sialytics has sales simulations through the Uptick platform that enable salespeople to practice different skills in a simulated virtual environment. I'm, I'm sitting in one of them right now. Um, but one of the things that we found that people have wanted to do is continue those opportunities for people to keep their skills sharp and to learn new skills. Um, you know, if you think about the area of selling, suddenly sales has gone from face-to-face -face meetings and product demos in person to trying to do everything over Zoom calls. Well, there was a lot of pressure early on in the pandemic to say, how do we change our sales forces skills? So that's necessitated a lot of changes to our roadmaps to focus on some similar things to what's already been said. How do we make these learning experiences available completely remotely? And how do we focus on bulking up the offerings that we have that enable people to simulate um, different environments they may find themselves in so that they can practice before they're actually on a Zoom call with one of their most critical customers <laughs> and trying to make a sale in a situation that um, feels very different than any situation they've been in before. Yeah, makes a lot of sense, David. Specifically from a learning context, I think this whole change, there has been a sea of change and, you know, a lot of opportunities as well. Uh, it's, uh, so, so, yeah, good to hear some of the stories that uh, Sialytics, how you have uh, tried to apply some of that in the product. Chris, uh, over to you. Yeah, absolutely. So, um I think, you know, if you if you take a look at the goals that we had prior to the pandemic and the day after um, we all got sent home from the office uh, to start working from home, uh, a lot of it uh, initially was, um, you know, we have a very broad platform with lots of lots of features and pieces of functionality. And instead of maybe picking up the next new big thing to go after, um, sharpening up the pieces of our 
or a system that would then become super important. So, you know, virtual career fairs, for instance, uh, virtual recruiting, uh, basically turning those modules that we had, you know, they were, they were in their cycle of, of growth and development to become excellent tools and, and would get there over time and kind of an agile iterative model. But now um, when this happens, it's sort of stop the presses on some other things and just get laser focused on the things that we know the market we the market um, and, and need it in short order and need it a lot. Um, so um, we, we had to pivot our roadmap entirely. And in that process, kind of found the opportunity from a product management perspective to um, really start living the agile kind of framework a little bit more inside the organization than we previously did. So, you know, it was, on, it was uh, kind of to, to Richard's point, you know, it was actually net good for the organization because we had a tool and we could just sort of beef it up and get focused on it and make it, make it what it needed to be to, um, and then basically give it away <laughs> for a number of months to help organizations kind of get through all of this. And then the goodwill that that brings obviously helps the organization overall in the, in the future. But, um, but it was, you know, how do we take the opportunity to be reflective upon the way that we did product development in the past um, and say, you know, we're going to need to move faster. We're going to need to react more quickly um, and uh, be, be looking at things more on the uh, next couple of weeks and next couple of months, as opposed to, you know, full next year about what we're going to be doing. So it's become a lot more tactical for us. Um, if Great. Great. Yeah, I think uh, excellent points, uh, all of you. And thanks, Chris, for sharing uh, how you pivoted it very quickly and used Agile and, you know, uh, effectively. Now, I, I feel, you know, it's a, it's, it's a blessing in disguise probably to be in the technology field because probably everybody is looking up to technology to solve some of the problems. So I think uh, from a pandemic standpoint, I think being in the technology area is a, is a safety cushion, if you will. So, so at least, you know, uh, people are looking forward to the challenges and uh, it's an opportunity to build something future so so let's move for, forward uh, to the presentation here i i've shared my screen hopefully it's visible mm -hmm. i didn't check last time so uh, so after hearing all these stories probably it's a it's a good time to go a little deeper into into our topic today um, which is about recalibrating the product roadmaps so we will we'll probably do it more in a question format. So we will open up with some questions that companies are asking how to prioritize product portfolios. And like I said, we will try to illustrate it with some examples uh, using three ideas around uh, one is around monetizing data. Other is about, you know, modernizing products as well as, uh, you know, focusing uh, on and the need for uh, more better integrations. So coming to uh, reprioritizing product portfolio, uh, some of the questions that some of our customers are asking us and we have dealt with um, based on where the product is and where the company is, uh, is it okay to do only focus short term and you know make maximize things there? So we, we had a large, uh, recruitment company that focused on, they had a portfolio of products, but they decided that they are going to focus on only on one specific product and leave the rest for the back burner. That seemed like a good strategy for them uh, in during the, during the pandemic uh, space rather than, you know, going after and building everything. Whereas there was another product company that, uh, which was in the payroll space, they thought this is a good time to invest in building an HR platform because of the customer base that they had. They thought that it was, it was good to, to diversify. Um, there have been companies who, who, whose focus was primarily on product and product engineering, but they shifted uh, quite a bit to integrations because they thought with Zoom, Slack, and some of these other tools becoming a very uh, important in the, in, in the way people are uh, connecting or using software, those integrations uh, probably are top priority. And not only those, integration with other products are probably a priority. And that's some of the roadmap changes that we have seen. So on, on, on that note, maybe I'll, 
I'll go back to the panelists and uh, want to ask them specifically, Chris, uh, if you can, you you sh- you alluded to something uh, to that effect, but if you could take us a little bit more deeper into how the pandemic has changed uh, some of your uh, product priorities. Sure, kind of uh, getting a little bit more specific. You know, I mentioned that it, it completely upended our roadmap. Um, and um, the good news is that, you know, it has been net beneficial, not just from, you know, I think we re- reacted cor- quickly and correctly. We got uh, some things out to the marketplace that they really needed. And, you know, at the same time, we took the opportunity to take a look at some of the processes and uh, that, that you were just talking about, right? So um, we always consider ourselves really big builders here, great people. You know, it's, it's a thing. It's a source of pride for us that we, we generally need to accept integration um, because, you know, we're kind of a core enterprise system. And so every single customer wants to integrate with several uh, different outside uh, vendors for pieces of the process that they may have gotten externally. Um, so um, our lens as to if uh, something is worth us building or worth us either partnering with or, you know, developing a repeatable partnership or integration with has changed because of the pandemic. You know, um, we, we need to be more careful about the prioritizations that we take on internally and make sure that anything that we're doing is really actually going to be a strategic benefit, not just for, for us, but obviously for customers going on a long-term basis. And we've been sort of beefing up um, the, uh, the capability that we have from an integration perspective. So, you know, our native sort of RESTful API um, set that any external provider can utilize, um, that has gotten a tremendous amount of attention over the past year um, and become much easier to use so that uh, it reduces the amount of time that our core engineering teams have to focus on integrating um, sort of one-off perspective type stuff so that they can focus on the more critical uh, instant needs that we have to address. Um, On the process side, uh, you know, we've, we, as I mentioned, we kind of took the opportunity to go back to what uh, agility actually means to us and try to install that through the rest of the organization and not just to our organization, but also to customers, you know, in front of customers. Uh, There's Mm -hmm. a, there's a double-edged sword that is being the agile sort of product development uh, organization and helping, uh, help, helping, well, taking the time to make sure that everybody involved understands both sides of it and why it ends up being a net benefit uh, to everybody. Uh, something that we actually took uh, the opportunity of starting about mid-year last year uh, to get into in a really serious way. Um, so, so it's uh, organizational-wide with us, organization-wide with us to um, install that Agile framework. Um, and then a much more um, clear and sort of a broader opinion set coming in about what is worth it, what is worth actually bringing in to do uh, the, the core development activities against. Um, with one of the interesting pieces that has evolved over the last year um, to be a lot more um, a part of the conversation is the iterative development of those things. So if we decide something is worth it for us to develop against, um, the padding of that to say we can get something out the door that actually solves the problem, maybe doesn't have every single thing that everybody could possibly want, which is a historical trap for product management in general, um, but gets it out the door in a way that's um, uh, minimally uh, usable, uh, testable, usable, lovable by the the customers. Um, That focus on making sure that we're living that um, uh, being honest with ourselves about it, uh, what that what that earliest kind of uh, piece is, and then making sure that we don't just forget about things. That's the other trap. It's to say we got this uh, earliest usable product out, and we're we're not getting to earliest lovable. Um, installing processes that ensure that we're going back to it to make it lovable um, is another kind of outcome, positive outcome of what has happened over the past year. Thanks. Thanks for going deeper and sharing some of that uh, examples with us. Uh, uh, David, uh, your perspective on this? Sure. I, I really like, Chris, I really like the uh, the uh, or the earliest lovable product. I like that as a way of defining it. We use um, minimally viable and exceptionally viable. So nice. same kind of idea, you know. It's I can't, I can't to take credit for it. I found it somewhere. So <laughs> I, know. I, I, I can't take credit for this one either. So, yeah, but there, there are great ways to look at it. Um, I think when you enter really uncertain times in general, um, the focus changes a little bit from what are you going to grow into to what can you secure? 
Um, because that was a lot of our thinking. I think a lot of companies went through that thought of, okay, we're going to deprioritize a little bit the focus on what are we going to be expanding into? Uh, what markets are we moving into? Uh, what new features are we going to be adding? And it, I think it's, you know, it's human nature to start thinking about, okay, are we safe in what we have during an extremely unsafe time? Um, so for us, I had already talked about that, you know, a lot of our, our, our lessons um, and our simulations needed to change. But for us, a lot of our thought went to who is our core user base? Um, we've been fortunate that we've always enjoyed some pretty good net promoter scores. Um, but I think that the pandemic made us refocus on that's never something that you, re- you want to ever take for granted. So a lot of our product roadmap shifted um, and the long term strategic goals of we're going to build features that will enable us to compete in this new marketplace or we're going to add new features that we don't see our competitors doing. That gave way a little bit to a focus more on what have our users been asking for that maybe we knew was important, but we didn't have at the top of our development list uh, until now. How do we take those strong net promoter scores and how do we make these into people that are actually in love with our product um, and increase the stickiness uh, of our, our LMS and of our sales simulations? So we prioritized a bit and we said, let's focus in 2020 and early 2021 on filling those gaps. Um, how do we take the things that have been slightly annoying to users and get them out of user's way? How do we take you know small features that users have been a- asking for and uh, put them into the product as quickly as possible? And we'll wait until a little later to make progress down the larger strategic roadmap. Um, and I think not only is that human nature to want to feel safe and feel more secure in the base that you have, I think it's been good strategy for pandemics for us or for any company is to look at, you know, we're in a time when you can't take anything for granted. So you shouldn't be. If you think at all that you're taking some of your user feedback for granted, or maybe you've pushed things, kicked the can down the line a little bit, because we'll get to that at some point, this is the time to go back, focus on those features, focus on those gaps, um, and look at those verticals where you perform the most strongly and say, rather than look at breaking into other new verticals right now, we're going to make sure that we are uh, unattackable or unassailable in those verticals by nailing down the product offerings that we have right now. Cool. Uh, thanks, David. I think that's an interesting perspective of, uh, you know, going stronger and deeper uh, into areas that you're, you're really good. So I'm sure some of us probably will also have similar, uh, you know, experiences or choices to, to make. Uh, moving further uh, to uh, to the next part of our discussion is around some examples and primarily around, uh, you know, uh, data and data analytics, which is kind of either for your own needs, like uh, using data in a better way so that you can, you can leverage it better or for your customers providing rich, uh, you know, analytics and user. Both are important pieces and there, there are many questions there. So I, I think I should just take time and, you know, not talk much, but get our panelists' view on this particular topic. And, you know, they have a rich experience, both uh, building and working on data analytics. So, so Raghav, uh, starting with you, um, you have a lot of background and experience uh, on the data side. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, like, how is our companies leveraging data and how Salesforce is specifically trying to do this as you're entering the HC market? Yeah, so... See, the data that we are leveraging today, I mean, we're looking at, you know, obviously what our customers are asking us, but in general, that what is the environment that we are operating in? And if we take, let's say, take talent acquisition as an example, one of the things that has changed completely as a result of this is that all our hiring, not just ours, I would say for most people, has gone completely virtual. You know, you the challenge that creates is that things that had appeal in the past, I mean, let's say that we could bring candidates into a Salesforce office and show them, you know, here's the environment you're working in, you'll be working in, here's the kind of people you get to meet, do other things like that has completely gone away. I mean, there is no way to do that. I mean, it will come back to some extent. So 
And we're also seeing that, for example, speaking of the data, that uh, as an example, there was a recent survey by the census, very recent in the last one month or so, that said that something like 4 million people are still are choosing to stay unemployed because they are afraid of the consequences of getting the virus. And there are plenty of others who are in a similar situation who don't want to go, can't go, they're blocked in. And we're hearing that from our customers too. So as an example, we built a product that allows people who are in the talent pipeline to connect with an insider, whether that's at us or if it's a client who's using it to at their company, with the view that to have a real heart-to-heart conversation. This is not a recruiter. This is not the hiring manager. This is not even you know somebody who's necessarily the interview with. They can specify the type of person they'd like to talk to, get a real sense of you know whether it's in the job, a certain demographic, or something else, and have a real heart-to-heart open conversation about what is it like to work here. Now, this is exactly a new idea. There have been attempts to do this. People, there are products which to do this, but now it has become front and center that this is a way for a lot of people to really understand what it's like to work at an employer, to have that conversation. It is something I expect will continue simply because that need exists. It has now become critical that this is how companies will recruit people, will allow that to pro- you know, if you've got somebody you're really interested in, you will bring them into these conversations just to allow that. So it is something that emerged the big, you know, it was a lower priority earlier. Now it has become something that's front and center for us. And anything else we are doing also, what we are seeing from the data, which may be very different in six months. You know, they some of these needs will be very different as to what people are wanting to do. I mean, there's the whole aspect that people still want to return to work. The data tells us that they want to do have some, they're missing social interactions with their colleagues and others. How do we address that? I don't have an answer today, but it is clear that from a lot of employee surveys and all that we are seeing that that is a need people want to see addressed. And my point is that there are roadmaps, or I think you made the point you were asking earlier, that are these that a short-term focus will almost certainly have to have a short-term focus. You know, we don't know what the long term is today. I mean, the long term today is six months at most, I would say. And it also means that we have to be brutal in defining what a product is that can be released very quickly. So it's not something that's going to take a long time to build or some or anything around those lines. It has to be focused on the here and now, not on a future that may or may not emerge. Wait. Yeah, I think that that's great perspective, Raghav. And I think being in Salesforce and the kind of access to information and data that you may have mm-hmm. probably will be leading some of the changes, you know, and people may be looking at that information to, to make some decisions. Uh, Richard, to you, I know you work with uh, different kinds of companies and uh, how are you leveraging data? I mean, uh, that's yeah. interesting to me. Yeah, this is an area that has really impacted our our product roadmap. So I'll give a short story. I get lots of spam emails every day from lots of businesses trying to sell me things. And one of the areas that I was getting a lot of emails was business intelligence reporting companies. And and they were quite, quite insistent. And all of them had a similar story. Use our business intelligence reporting. It'll make analyzing and gaining insights into your business really, really easy. And, um, and so, um, you know, I said, well, gee, everybody would like business intelligence. You know, everybody would like easy, uh, easy insights into their business, right? So we went down the path of evaluating one of these in depth, and it was very, very helpful. And as what it gave to me was a strategy that I didn't have before. So we have a, we have a transaction system that has lots and lots and lots of data, but it's a transaction system and it's very difficult to report off. And I don't care how good your business intelligence reporting is. It's just not going to be easy to get data out of our transaction system. So as what we did on our roadmap is we created a data warehouse. And I put an engineer uh, on it who had experience in data warehouses, which are different than a transaction database. And we, uh, we collect and transform the data from our, tran- from our transaction system into the data warehouse constantly. Some aspects of the system are updated every 10 minutes into the data warehouse. Some things are updated daily. We have, we spent weeks getting, uh, you know, some 
data out of Salesforce so that we could also report on that. And so now we have a team in the company um, that's responsible for being able to produce answers to what if questions. And we have gone to managing our business by data to a far greater extent than we ever had before. You know, lots of people manage their business uh, based upon their latest customer conversation. Um, and, and this, you know, building the technology in our product roadmap of having an actual data warehouse has enabled it. And then we were able to choose, you know, there's a really good selection of very powerful business intelligence reporting systems out there. And so then we're able to leverage, you know, leverage those one other aspect where we have really embraced data is in our hiring. We, we always use uh, assessments now. You know, to your point, uh, you can't bring people into the office. You can't, you know, look them in the eye and talk to them and have that feeling. It's got to be more analytical. And so I think the employment assessments has been a big thing. And it's actually a good, a really good thing. With data, you do make better decisions than you do based upon the judgment. You know, my, uh, you know, I don't know that I consider myself good at hiring people, but on my best day, I'm 50 50. Um, you know, and using employee assessments, uh, very, very powerful. Great. Uh, thanks, Richard, for sharing that. And I, I think, uh, you know, how you built a data warehouse and how you're internally using it. Um, not so much your customers are seeing it, but I'm sure it's indirectly benefiting your customers as well uh, as, as you're making these databases. Yeah, I will, I will add to that. You know, that it's, it also gets back to the, we do use it to service our customers and different customers have different needs. Our customers are primarily uh, small business and small business is not necessarily run so much by data, they're more worried about running their business day to day. And so it's what we try and do with our system is help them run our business. And uh, we're not necessarily trying to provide them with decision with data to make decisions in their business, but using that data to help us serve their business more effectively. That's our perspective. Great. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. So we further along, um, to touch upon some examples of uh, product makeovers, uh, being how we are targeting remote workforce. So when it comes to you now thinking probably mobile first or primarily cloud first or thinking of uh, building it uh, an onboarding experience for the remote workforce, uh, if you will. So these are some of the questions and thoughts that, that come to um, our minds and you know, how, how do we build or re-engineer our, our roadmaps to, to, to cater to some of these emerging requirements? So on that note, let me uh, bring in David and ask him uh, this uh, specific question in that. Uh, and he's seeing, I, David, you're seeing a lot of changes in the learning space and, and demand. And, uh, so how, how are you looking at uh, Product makeovers. Have you considered anything in this last one year, or you're planning for something as as you see the changes that are happening? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a this is a great question to ask, and and uh, for us, the answer is yes. Um, we just completed a makeover of the user interface of the Uptick software, and we're working on a makeover of the Digital Chalk LMS. Um, in general, I'd say one of the principles that I think is always important and that we need to continue to stick to is if you think about it, consumer-based software is purchased by people. Um, Business-based software is also purchased by people. Um, and I think we forget that sometimes. I think we look at our software as being, you know, that something's different about being a business-based software, but it's purchased by people who want to have an enjoyable experience using it. Um, now, I'll, I, I approach this from the, the psychologist aspect of it to say that when we're in very uncertain times and we're in changing times, uh, comfort and safety and security goes way up on people's minds. And that applies to the way people look at the software that they interact with on a daily basis. The software that provides that feeling of security and ease of use that you don't have to fight with 
is one less item that can be adding stress to already a very stressful time. Um, you know, we, we are at no, we, we are in no risk of not getting enough stress in our daily lives um, right now. So the last thing you want in general, but especially now, is for your software to be a source of stress. Um, I, I, I'm a big proponent on user experience as being one of the things that help software to become sticky uh, and to stay that way. But I think that's even more critical now. So we're looking at ways that we can um, make for user interfaces that are the, the term we use internally is zero learning curve. So the kind of thing that just like a cell phone app, um, you can pick it up and immediately start using it. You don't need me to show you how to use it. It shows you as you go um, how to use it. I think that this puts any company that does this at a pretty big advantage because um, if you look at the number of software programs that HR uh, generalists have to interact with on a daily basis, I think the average is somewhere around eight or nine different software packages they're interacting with. Mm -hmm. You want to be the one that is um, the one that delights them. The one that they feel, hey, I have no problem going into this system. I enjoy using it. Please don't switch to something else. You don't want to be the one that is the one that they have to use because there currently is no alternative. Because although there currently is no alternative, there will be. Um, because someone has identified that there is a gap in that marketplace and they're going after it. So kind of the short answer, the summed up answer to all that is, yeah, this is a good time to look at your user experience, your user interface, to make sure that it's modern, to make sure that it requires as little learning as possible. Um, you don't want to be on someone's radar screen as this is an annoying product to use. I wish there was an alternative. <laughs> you want to be in that nice, safe category of we love using this. They're great. It's easy to use. It's responsive, and we're sticking with it. Great, David. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that experience that you actually went to the product makeover last year. And, you know, timing wise, probably it worked out well for you. So thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Raghav, your perspective. Um, yeah, it's certainly an opportunity to look at what could be done differently. And I'll use a slightly different example. Uh, see, I was at uh, Con Ferry earlier and I left that in the middle of the pandemic to join Salesforce. But one of the things was that, uh, you know, Conferry is, of course, a very large RPO talent company. And uh, well, most of our focus had been on talent acquisition products. And, well, the market for those effectively disappeared or shrank by 70, 80 percent virtually overnight. But the advantage that we saw at the time was that this was an opportunity to focus more on talent management, what's on the internal talent, which frequently gets sh short shrift at a lot of companies. So Conferry built this talent intelligence platform, which is what do we have? What can we do with that in a much better way than anything that was previously the case? And that actually has found a lot of appeal because what we are seeing today, I mean, certainly, you know, a lot of companies are seeing this today is that, you know, with the economy accelerating the higher turnover, people wanting to leave and all that. What can we do to really put that front and center for people? What are their opportunities? What kind of mobility options do they have? Where can they grow? Tying it directly to learning opportunities, which, I mean, you had all this in bits and pieces earlier. I mean, there's a product for every single one of these needs earlier, but to put it all together in a form that provides really high quality talent intelligence on your internal workforce was something that, did exist very well. And I mean, we are working on a version of that ourselves, but it is the kind of an example that that was where you could see that given the situation you were in, that was an opportunity to take what was primarily focused on talent acquisition and do a makeover to focus on talent inside of talent management. So, I mean, I think you're going to see more and more of that because of that very reason that our needs are different. You know, it's, it's a different world today. True, I think that's an important point in terms of how the needs are changing and how you can adapt one product mm -hmm. very quickly to others. And this may be a time to do something like that if you see the, mm -hmm. see the opportunity. Uh, great point, uh, so, so yeah, I think uh, you probably have 
five minutes and maybe we have one more topic to cover. Hopefully we'll, we'll be able to manage that. Um, so the last uh, uh, point was about integrations and integrations are becoming even more important in today's world than, you know, uh, prior and customers are demanding that quite a bit. So I'd like to take this opportunity to pose it to Chris and Richard, starting with Chris, uh, mm -hmm. saying that, uh, you know, from your perspective and your product, uh, what are you seeing the integration requirements? Have they increased, changed, or yes, or what's happening? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, in the current environment, I think, you know, we have not necessarily seen a dramatic uptick in requests for integrations kind of due to the current environment, but it's always been a thing. And so how we handle it on our side has had to change um, kind of along to, you know, some of the previous comments that I and the rest of the folks made about how product roadmaps have had to be a little bit more carefully addressed. Um, integrating with a third party system in our uh, world, you know, we have dozens and dozens of them and we're always working on dozens of them at a time uh, for all the new customers that we're bringing on board. But um, again, the tooling to make sure that our system is prepared um, to be able to make those things uh, easier, be able to push some of the effort back onto the third-party vendor um, in some cases, as opposed to uh, us having to do kind of bespoke development against them is something that we've definitely focused on as a result of a, re, uh, you know, a closer look at our, our product processes over the past year. Um, you know, we're always thinking about uh, the, the implications of the build by partner ourselves. And one of the things that makes us a little bit different in our space is that we like to have an opinion um, about these things. That is, you know, where we see something that is a repeatable sort of piece of functionality that customers want to bring into our platform. Um, and there's dozens and dozens of providers out there that might do that thing, um, whether it's assessments or background checks or um, you know, name it, uh, anything along the talent acquisition. Mm -hmm. uh, we are always saying, okay, would it be good for us to build that? Is that something that kind of fits with our mission? Um, if not, and in a lot of cases, it's not, you know, we're not going to build a background check um, competency here at Great People. Um, how do we How do we decide to, you know, first of all, make it easy for the external party to integrate, but then um, look at the marketplace, look at who's performing the best, use that data to um, say, okay, we're going to build effectively a special integration, um, you know, a more in-depth integration with a market leading provider um, that we can then go to the, org you know, to our customer organizations and say, yeah, you can bring us whoever you want. Um, over here, we have this relationship that, um, you know, we know these, this one over here performs really well. We've gone to the nth degree with the integration. Um, with that, that type of provider. That's something that we've gotten more into as we've um, started to be more uh, careful about what it is that we invest in for core development ourselves. So, um, so kind of having an opinion and bringing that, you know, we've, we've done the research for you. Um, you can integrate with anybody that you want to, but um, here's why it makes sense to go with somebody that uh, we think will add additional value and actually make uh, the overall process thing, which then makes us look good, uh, frankly, uh, when the integrations work out really well. So, so that's that's what we've been up to here over the past year. Richard, any any ten seconds, thirty seconds point on that? We, uh, uh, we definitely okay. work on product integrations. I will tell you, I was on PTA, PTO yesterday and got roped into a product integration uh, conference call. So it's definitely um, something that we do. I would say that the number one factor that we use in, in doing product integrations is customer demand and getting real genuine customer feedback of, yes, I want to use this, and yes, this is important to me, is different than possibly the sales guys saying, hey, I think we can sell this, this would be great, why don't you go do this? You can, you can put a lot of energy into those kinds of things with little reward, but when you have solid data from customers saying, yes, this is important to me, that uh, that's generally a good a good integration to do, unless it's a core core competency that you need to build yourself. So I I, I like the last comment of you know build by partner. Um, we do yeah. these things all the time. You're on mute, Shrikant. Shrikant, you're on mute. Well, I went on mute. I don't know. Maybe I clicked the wrong button. But thanks. Uh, I think it was a very interesting discussion how markets are shifting and how, you know, roadmaps are kind of central and how there's 
new ways of looking at it short term long term and you know there are some who are staying course but some who are pivoting so so i think interesting stories overall so thanks uh, to all the panelists uh, for your views i know we don't have enough time for discussion question but I, i'm sure we have raised enough points that uh, you know uh, if needed you can get back to either me or chris david raga or richard too for any specific question so uh, thanks once again to hrta for the opportunity and uh, uh, sorry for going over by a minute but uh, it was uh, wonderful hosting the panel today